Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, it's uh, our very, uh, great pleasure to uh, invite uh, uh, Kartik from the University of Chicago to give a talk about the Q shop. Uh, Kartik is a PhD student, but he already did a lot of uh, important, uh, I mean, uh, contributions to, to the uh, quantum programming, uh, including the type system, uh, and also uh, uh, the former semantics of Q sharp. So let's uh, let's welcome. Kadi, can now uh, you can start. Sure. Thank you, Mingsheng, for the introduction and having me here. Thank you. Thank um, you. All right. So yeah, here uh, I will uh, talk to you all about uh, talk to you all today about uh, Lambda Q sharp which is a small language that I developed over the past two years or so. And uh, through that work, we showed that uh, the programming language Q Sharp from Microsoft can be seen as a quantum algorithmic language or ALGOL. And I'll, I'll describe more details uh, in my talk today. And this, this work is a part of a larger project called the Essence of Q Sharp in which uh, we are defining the formal semantics of Microsoft's QSharp language and also trying to improve its type system. So yeah, my name is Karthik. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Chicago. And uh, um, let, let me just start off with some motivation on uh, um, uh, about my research and what kind of uh, things interest me in the quantum setting. So here's a long-term vision for computing for the, you know, since the development of computer science as a discipline, uh, uh, we, we think of it as an engineering discipline as well. But compared to other engineering disciplines, such as civil engineering, where we get specific guarantees about the product, such as a bridge, uh, we are sort of, uh, uh, you know, popular for not providing guarantees about the software. You know, we come up with the uh, EULAs, which say that there is no guarantee with this software. So Vineet Paleri was, uh, is my uh, undergrad advisor. So this is over 10 years ago that he said something like this to me and has inspired me over the years. How can we make computing give more guarantees about, you know, uh, about products? Can, how can we grow as an engineering discipline, right? So we, we were not able to achieve this over the last 70 years in, in the classical setting. So quantum computing, which is just coming up, provides a unique opportunity where we can do things right from the beginning in a very principled manner. So this is sort of the long-term vision I have for computing and uh, that inspires my research. So uh, there are several ways people talk about, uh, you know, writing correct software. Uh, this is a slide that I got from Professor Benjamin Pierce. He he teaches this lecture class on software foundations every year at UPenn. So uh, there's a whole spectrum here. Uh, people try to use social methods such as doing code reviews or pair programming. There are methodological or process-oriented approaches you can take using design patterns or writing tests. People do version controls and tracking bugs and issues, right? And then there are te technical things you can do. You can run linters or do static analysis. You can do random testing or fuzzing. And then there are very mathematical approaches which involve sound type systems and formal verification. So my interests really lie in this part of the you know, spectrum. And today I'll talk about sound type systems and not so much about formal verification. And just as Benjamin mentions here, you know, these, uh, these, this is not a trade-off. If we want to have reliable software, we need to use all of these kinds of methods. And there's a funny quote by Donald Knuth here, uh, beware of the bugs in the above code. I've only proved it correct, not tried it. So just to say that formal things can also have problems sometimes. So it's, that's why it's useful to try all, all kinds of approaches. So um, why, why do we care about reliable software in the quantum setting, right? So one of the reasons is that the classical techniques that we are familiar with, uh, they do not transfer. So we, in, in classical setting, we you know, run the code and try to see uh, what happened. 
but we cannot easily do it in quantum because the state collapses when we try to observe it, right? And uh, we cannot do simulation beyond tens of qubits because it's physically impossible or really expensive. Um, then the cost of running programs on physical quantum computers is really high. I mean, we don't really have quantum computers yet, or if we do, they are noisy. Uh, they involve, you know, delay setting up the machine. So if we, if we run incorrect programs, the cost gets worse. So it's important to be able to run correct programs uh, and know that they're correct before running them, right? So this is, so based on this, uh, the approach that I apply in my work is to see how can we adapt the best of classical static typing techniques in the quantum realm? And uh, today I'll talk more about this work. And uh, this initial work was published at QPL earlier this year. And the other thing we can do is formal verification. But I really like to uh, approach in my work um, the techniques that can bring reasoning closer to programming. So programmers benefit with the verification that we are trying to do. And some initial work I did on this kind of approach uh, was this something called quantum whole type theory, which I will not talk about today as much. Um, so moving on, uh, this is sort of the outline I'll go through. Uh, I'll give a brief background on Q sharp. Uh, I'll introduce Lambda Q sharp and show its properties and uh, its type system. And then there's some ongoing work I'm doing. This won't be really polished. It's just ideas on how to extend the previous work to have uh, even more coverage of Q-sharp and especially about arrays. And I'll show why that is difficult and just conclude with some additional directions in summary. Oh, and I forgot to say earlier, but I would like this talk to be very interactive. So please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. And unfortunately, I cannot see anybody's faces right now while I'm presenting. So please just interrupt me by voice and I'll be happy to uh, clarify and answer questions along the way. All right, so let's let's talk about Q-sharp. Um, it's a programming language uh, for quantum computing introduced by Microsoft in 2017. Uh, in my, you know, uh, learning about Q-sharp, I, I realized that it's really a, F-sharp like domain specific language, but on surface it looks like C-sharp. And it's documented by one of the developers of Q-sharp, John Azaria, in a blog post and a talk, how Q-sharp evolved from F-sharp really. So that already gave us a hint that, you know, there is a functional programming core to this language, which is not obvious. Then the model that programming model it assumes is a QRAM, that is a quantum computer is considered as a coprocessor to a classical machine, which is one of the most common models people use. A um, couple interesting things about Q-sharp, it maintains a clean separation between functions and operations, where functions involve only classical computation, while operations involve all the quantum computation, but they can also involve classical computation. So this separation is reminiscent of Algol-like languages, and I will demonstrate why that is. Uh, I mean, Algol also combined functional and imperative programming in a very safe manner um, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, so to talk about quantum operations, they are basically serial lies instructions, and they, they relate to uh, monads in Haskell uh, I mean, monads basically let you just, you know, uh, do effectful programming in a pure setting. So in my work, I show that quantum operations are monadic in, in Q-sharp, and I'll demonstrate that as well. Other interesting features are most bindings in Q-sharp, that is variables you create will be immutable by default, and it supports metaprogramming using adjoint and control operations among other features. So we'll, we'll see some of that. Um, here is a sample program in Q-sharp to do teleportation. So we see here on the first line that you can import a library. Um, notice that uh, this intrinsic library includes the definitions for basic gates such as H, X, Z, C0, and even measurement. Uh, this just shows that Q-sharp is designed to be very generic on the gate set available. You can parameterize it with any gate sets that you like and these are not hard-coded in the language. 
Um, so there are, you know, to do teleportation, we do entanglement, we send a message, and then we decode the message. So the functions are described here. So let's look at them one by one. Um, and of course, there is Alice and Bob and the message, three variables, three qubits corresponding to what we would like to do in teleportation. So to entangle, we I will not go through all of the code. I just want to highlight some interesting things. First of all, these are all operations because they involve quantum computation. None of these are functions. Secondly, uh, in Q sharp, uh, qubits are not uh, treated in a linear manner or there is no linear typing. So notice that we are performing uh, computation on these two qubits uh, in place. So when we apply header mod on QLS, we are not getting a new qubit. We are modifying Alice in, uh, in place. So it's computation by side effect as uh, it was written on the previous slide. Similarly, applying C0 leads to computation by side effect on the two qubits. And notice that the output here is unit. That is a trivial output. We are not returning qubits or anything. So this is what I mean by that, um, that quantum instructions are monadic sequence of instructions, right? And we also see this annotation called ADJ, which just means that this entangle operation can have a joint, which means you can run it in reverse and q -sharp compiler will automatically, can automatically generate it or, or you can provide a implementation yourself. Right, send message is some sim very simple. It's just measuring the two qubits after doing the, you know, uh, C naught and H gate and returning a pair of booleans. And then decode, we look at those booleans and apply, conditionally apply Z and X gates on the Bob's qubit and then we get the result. So that's just a sample. So let's talk about why do we even need to specify Q sharp formally? Now, Qsharp is a large language, and uh, since Microsoft is behind it and a lot of people work on it, it, there's, it's a, it has a potential to become a very popular language. I think it's already quite popular among the industry. So um, we know in the PL community that if we have sound language design principles involved in the language design, it leads to better language in terms of how easy it is to write, how easy it is to compose and to maintain. Um, and this kind of work has seen benefit in other languages before. So standard ML, which is what I base my work on a lot, was very influential. Then featherweight Java and featherweight Go led to polymorphism being adopted in these languages uh, in the industry in both Java and Go. Uh, then there are similar works in JavaScript and Rust setting. Further, this this uh, our work aligns with the uh, you know design principle five uh, documented by Bettina Haim in her thesis, who is one of the chief designers of QSharp. That QSharp is a living body of work that will grow and evolve over time. So I think our work will help evolve it in a nicer manner. So let's talk about uh, how do we approach this work. And this is where I, I used a lot of what was done in standard ammo. It was really a pioneer in how to uh, formalize uh, language in a scalable manner so it can grow and evolve. And there's a funny quote by Tony Hoare that inside every language there's a small language struggling to get out. So uh, I think Lambda Q-sharp is that language for Q-sharp. So the recipe is, um, as, as worked out in standard ML, uh, that you can define a well-behaved internal language, a small core language. With well-behaved, I mean that it will have some nice properties such as uh, the scoping of uh, every variable will be clear, the typing will be clear, uh, etc. Then you define an elaboration or translation relation from the external surface language, in this case Q-sharp, to the internal language, here uh, Lambda Q-sharp. Right. And then you can specify the static and dynamic semantics using the, you know, your well-behaved internal core. So static just means the type system, which will rule out meaningless programs. And I'll show how it does that in our case. Um, and dynamics means the operational or equational semantics that specify what the meaning of those programs is at a high abstraction level. 
And once we have all of this, we can prove meta theorems about type preservation and safety, and we can also study consequences of extensions and variations. So speaking of uh, Q sharp, let's see some problems that exist in Q sharp. Here are two programs which are both unsafe or incorrect, but Q sharp compiler allows them to go through. That is, it does it it just uh, does not complain and they pass the compiler. So here is a program where we are trying to uh, apply a C not gate on two qubits. But if you read the program, um, we are creating a new qubit using the use keyword in Q sharp. Then uh, we are creating another binding for that qubit Q2 by using the let uh, statement or let expression and applying C not gate on this. So in this trivial program, it's very easy to see that Q1 and Q2 are the same qubit. But it is not. It may not be always obvious when you are deep into a program. Uh, but this program goes through, and it's completely incorrect because uh, this means if, if you visualize it as a quantum circuit, it's kind of fanning out from the first qubit or cloning the first qubit. So this should be disallowed. But currently, Q sharp does not uh, do that. Here's another program uh, where you you create a new qubit and you suddenly return it. And uh, the type output type is qubit, so this qubit is returned. But if you think about it, uh, uh, memory model in Q-sharp is such that the qubits get deallocated in the same lexical scope that is within these braces where they are created. So by this point in the program, this qubit should not exist. So when you return a qubit here, you are really getting a dangling reference to that qubit. And if you use it anywhere, anything can go wrong. Again, this is something Q sharp currently does not disallow. That is the compiler does not complain and just works. So these are some of the motivating examples which I'll show how we can uh, avoid in Lambda Q sharp. So let's, let's talk about Lambda Q sharp now. Um, so uh, I'll talk about types then expressions and then commands. So here are uh, types. Um, so there are two things in this grammar. There are qubit symbols. I'll show them in the orange color. So Qs are qubit symbols. And then there are types. So types are something, things that you will expect. There is a qubit reference type, which is corresponding to the qubit type in Q sharp. The only interesting thing is that it, this qubit reference type in lambda Q sharp is indexed by a static name or static symbol Q here. And this, this helps a lot. We will see what it does. But bas this basic idea is inspired by alias types in the classical PL literature from you know uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, so with this you know, static symbol Q, we will be able to uniquely identify each qubit reference. right? So then there is a type for functions. Then there is a type for encapsulated commands. We will see what that means. Then you can have product types, booleans, and units. So this is fairly simple. The only interesting thing is the QREF type, right? So let's talk about expressions. Um, expression language in Q-sharp is essentially a modernized algo, and this is from Bob Harper's book in chapter 34. I'll, I'll just go through these ones to make them clear, but there is nothing interesting or nothing quantum going on here. So there are variables, there are lead bindings, there are functions, lambdas, there are applications, tuples and projections for product types, true false for Boolean type and if expression as well, and then the value for unit. And there are expressions to encapsulate commands. So let's let's talk about commands next. Right, so <clears throat> um, commands are uh, monadic, like I said before. Uh, if you're familiar with Haskell, you will be familiar with return and bind. So those are the same expressions here. Uh, return basically takes an expression E and converts it into a command. So return is fairly trivial. What bind does is it uh, it executes uh, encapsulated command E, binds it results result to X variable, new variable X, and then continues with the following command M. We'll, we'll see some examples, but uh, um, yeah, these these are common in any monadic language like Haskell or 
um, wherever you see monads, you might you might end up seeing return and bind, right? So, uh, and then we have uh, quantum specific commands. So we have a command to create new qubits, qubit references, right? We have a command for gate application, gate app, which takes, which is parameterized by some unitary. So unitaries are also symbols in our language. That is, you can provide any arbitrary unitaries to the grammar and have a application command created for it, right? So this is a usual command for uh, multi-qubit gate application of size n. And then you have controlled gate application as well, which also which applies on n plus one gates, where if the input is zero, you apply u. If it is, sorry, if the control is zero, you apply u. If control is one, you apply v. So E1 is control and E2 is the rest of the qubit inputs to the command. And then there is a measure. So here the key idea or the most important thing is that this, if you notice this new QRef command, it comes with its own uh, scope. So what happens is when you create a new qubit, it will be created in the background in the memory and then it, it will be bound to the variable x, which will only be accessible inside m. That is outside of this command, the qubit does not exist, right? So th this this helps us enforce a uh, stack discipline common in algo-like languages, which means automatic memory management. You don't need to do garbage collection. You do not need to manually deallocate things. Uh, it is great. And Q -sharp also allows that, but it doesn't do it very well. All right, so let's see some of the typing rules. Um, to understand these typing rules, I'll go through them in a little detail. Uh, let's let's understand the typing uh, schema or uh, judgment form first. So gamma is the usual context uh, which under which this uh, typing holds. So M is a well-formed command. So right, M is the command which is relative to this signature sigma. I will talk a little bit about sigma but let's uh, assume that every judgment form is parameterized by this sigma signature, okay? And then this m command uh, returns a value of type tau. So that, that's how you read this um, judgment form, right? Um, so yeah, let's talk about signature sigma. So sigma is the, uh, it's, it's like a stack that we use to keep track of qubit symbols that I introduced in the types slide. Uh, so whatever qubit symbols are available in scope, they will be inside stored inside the signature sigma, and uh, we ins we mandate that they are distinct. They can never be duplicated or uh, erased uh, on their own. So uh, this this will be important. Uh, I'll show you where. And uh, one way to think about the signature, as I already said, is it's it's a stack which will help us enforce the stack discipline. So let's see the use of that here um, in new QRef command. So what we're trying to do is just create a new, Q, new uh, qubit, right? And I explained X will bind to it. So we start with this, but if, when we go in the precondition, we'll see that a new Q, qubit symbol Q has been added to sigma. So that corresponds to the new qubit, new logical qubit that's created. Right, and we also see a new uh, variable binding in the context here. So X is bound to this new value of qubit reference. It's it's a pointer to this qubit, right? And within that extended context gamma and extended signature, sig extended signature sigma, this this M command is well formed and returns some value. We do not know what that is, but it's the same as what this will return. Okay. So let's uh, look at measurement now. Measurement is very, very simple. It's just It just requires that this expression E should have the type QREF, uh, with, you know, it should be a qubit, which should be available in the signature, obviously. Um, and then it will a, return a Boolean output. So this is the simplest uh, rule here. Now let's look at gate applications. Um, so to apply, a, n qubit gate u on an expression e, we need to have that e is a tuple, that is a value of product type, uh, and it should it's mandated that each of the qubit symbols 
in it are uh, distinct. They are from one to n. So by um, syntax alone, we are um, statically we are ensuring that each of these qubits are supposed to be unique to be able to use this rule. And this will be important, uh, especially in this rule when we you know, see the examples, right? Um, so controlled qubit is similar, except uh, controlled gate application is similar, except E1 is the control qubit. So if we see that it has some symbol Q associated with it. And E2 is the rest of the qubits. So they are N in number and they are distinct from Q. So they are Ri's from R1 to Rn, right? So with this rule, you may be able to imagine what might be happening in the examples, but I will work through them next. So here is the example we had seen before where we were trying to do cloning, uh, right? So in lambda Q sharp subtraction text, this program translates to this, where you have, uh, you create a new qubit corresponding to use, bind it to Q1, and then you return the output of the following command, which has a let expression binding Q2 to Q1. And then following that, there is this command, which is apply, diagonal i to x on q1 and q2. So why do we see this diagonal here? Um, so c naught corresponds to this uh, quantum circuit, right? It can also be written this way. That is, a, it's a block diagonal, which, which applies i2 if the control is zero and x when the control is one. So that's the form we see in our um, diagap command. Uh, this this is syntactic sugar, so it looks a little different, but basically corresponds to the controlled qubit application that we saw earlier, right? Now we can apply our diagap rule here. So uh, notice that I said that, you know, these qubit symbols are supposed to be distinct, right? So we see when we step through this program in lambda Q-sharp, we'll see that Q1's type is QRef Q1, the RN symbol Q1 and Q2's type is also the same. So we'll see that Q and Q is instantiated to Q1 and R1 is instantiated to also Q1. So these are not distinct anymore. So th this program uh, fails the type checker and is, is rejected, right? Okay, moving on. Um, let's talk about the second pro program, program we saw uh, where we were returning a dangling qubit. In lambda Q-sharp, it's very simple. It's a lambda where you are returning the execution of the result of the following command, which is just new Q-ref, bound it, bind it to X and return that X right away. So let's see what happens in the typing rule. So we said that we, we worked through this typing rule before, so I'll not go through the details again. So we see that in the extended context, so if, if you see the premise of the rule, um, retex correctly has this type, that is it will return a value of this type because uh, there is Q available in the signature and X is a valid um, variable in the context. But when you go down back here in the conclusion, that signature does not have Q anymore, right? So we see that this is invalid. This judgment does not hold anymore. So this this is how we see that lambda Q sharp rejects, um, you know, a, a qubit that may go out of its scope that is syntactically enforced here, right? So this is some of, uh, what we showed in the lambda Q sharp work. Uh, more details are in the paper. Um, and so this is like the first part of the talk to conclude the, we show that we can lambda Q sharp and thereby Q sharp are algo like languages and they safely combine pure classical and effectful quantum computation. And they also obey strict stack, stack discipline for doing automatic qubit memory management. And uh, some of you may recognize the symbol. Uh, it, it's uh, in here I'm using it to show that it's a safe synthesis of functional lambda and imperative style programming, which is often shown with this symbol. So in the paper, we have a, a equational semantics based on Sam Staton's fully complete equational theory of for quantum computation published in Popple 2015. And we also show elaboration rules for a large chunk of Q sharp to translate to lambda Q sharp. 
And this was joint work with Kesha Haitala, Sarah Marshall, and Robert Rand, uh, published at QPL, and link is available. So I would uh, love to stop here and take any questions before moving on to ongoing work. Um, does anyone have questions? So Katika, I, I, uh, I, I, I couldn't see how you can do uh, the, the caching in the Lambda Q shop. Do you have this uh, recaching? I, I mean, the cache safer programs in the Q shop. So, sorry, uh, what can we do or not do? I did not get that word. So I, I cannot see how you can uh, uh, write uh, uh, the care safe stuff. Oh, recursive, yeah. Yeah, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the Lambda Q, Q shop, so. Right, yeah, so recursion is currently not allowed and this is following uh, uh, Q sharp. I mean, I think Q sharp currently also does not allow unrestricted uh, recursion. Do you have any idea how uh, you can add the recursion into the Lambda Q sharp? Yeah, uh, I think uh, we will have to extend the, I mean, in a way it's very easy to, ex so since our Lambda is very general, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is like a functional programming style, lambda calculus style lambda. So um, we can add recursion directly using these. But uh, um, but maybe not. If you go to the next slide, uh, because you have this uh, control, uh, control gate app, yeah. say uh, uh, E1 or E2 uh, contains some uh, program identifiers, and then uh, very hard to def define the, the semantics of that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It it can get difficult. And uh, I mean, so far I've not thought too deeply about it because um, Q Sharp currently does not allow that. And yeah, yeah. I've been guided by how to, you know, represent Q Sharp in a formal manner. Right. Thank you. Yeah, but but you're right that we can get into trouble if we try to just do it without thinking very hard. Good. So actually, concerning the, the, the Professor Yin's question, actually this is very similar to a simply typed lambda calculus. And then in order to uh, to be more powerful, to have more expressive power, actually you need to they go from the simply typed lambda calculus to the classic the PCF. So in that case, you need to add something like a, a fixed point operator, something like this, in order to okay. express recursive I mean, programs, right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. I, I, I did look at, uh, I mean, there is a work from Margarita Zorzi. So there is a quantum version of PCF. Oh. So I think they, they kind of look into that kind of uh, extension. Um, but again, for this work, we did not need it. So I, you know, did not think very hard about it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right that using PCF, we can extend uh, this language with recursive functions as yeah. well. So, so the, the paper about the uh, quantum and the PCF, uh, I didn't saw it, so uh, where, where is it? Uh, if you go to the bibliography I maintain and search for PCF or QPCF, I think you will find it very easily. Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I I forgot to mention that you are the, the, the okay. literature web page. So it's okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Other questions? All right. If not, I can uh, now move to the second part of the talk, which is describing some ongoing work. Um, and this is not very polished, it's just early ideas, but uh, um, I hope to show what why some, some things are very hard in QSHA. So uh, in, in this ongoing work, I'm trying to see how we can incorporate arrays in this uh, Lambda QSHA work, because I did not talk about arrays at all, and QSHA has, uses arrays a lot, and qubit arrays specifically, right? And there were other features that I did not talk about, so a little bit about them. So here is a program which shows why Q, Q sharp arrays are highly expressive, but also very challenging to safely type. So what's happening here is we are trying to do a, you know, a 
chain of C0 gates on a qubit array. So imagine applying, uh, you know, to each pair one one by one. So it's a ladder. So first two, then the second and third qubit, and the third and fourth qubit, right? So this program takes a single qubit array as input. And this is the syntax for qubit array, right? And what it's doing in a single line is uh, using this function called apply to each. Uh, I'll show what it does, but it's basically applying whatever is the first argument to the rest of the, uh, to the input, second input, which will be an array, right? In this case, C0 is a two argument uh, operation, right? So the library design, library writers of QSharp did this very, you know, idiomatic style functional programming here to construct the right kind of input that C0 can consume, which can then be given to apply to each, right? So they took QS and they took the most QS, which means all entries of the qubit array QS except the last, and they took the rest, that is all except the first, rest is equivalent to the tail function in, in functional programming. And then they create a zipped version of this uh, sets of inputs. So they got like, you know, the pairs that we wanted, the 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, right, et cetera. And in this single line function, then this whole C0 chain program can be written. So this shows the expressive power that QSharp lets you, uh, gives you to write uh, common patterns, common in Q quantum computing, right? But if you think about it, it's very hard to verify that this program is correct or type check because um, this will go wrong. Like we saw C0 has this difficulty that it doesn't know if the two inputs are correct, they are distinct, right? So if, if this uh, array QS had, you know, duplicate qubits, this program can go wrong. So in a way, uh, while writing this program, the programmer has an implicit specification in mind uh, such that all the qubits in this array are unique, but it's not expressed anywhere, right? So our idea is to basically make these specifications explicit, and I'll show some ways we can do that, right? And the other idea is to, after making these implicit specifications explicit, how can we automate this reasoning so we can uh, avoid the burden of manually doing type checking? Right, so we can use industry scale solvers like Z3. So um, let, let's see what the implicit specifications and types are for all the five, six functions we saw here, right? So C0 is simple. We saw that control and target uh, qubits are required and it's implicit that they are distinct from each other. It's not shown here. So these are copy pasted uh, versions of these functions and operations directly from QSharp's library code. Right, so there is apply to each, and this uh, code T that you see means it's a generic or polymorphic operation. So while T is a type argument, and um, it just means all of these functions which have T as its type argument are all parametric in that. So apply to each takes an operation which you know is of the same type and returns a unit, and it also takes a register of uh, you know, that type, array of that type. So in, in our case, it was qubit array, and this was a operation that would apply on a qubit, right? So, uh, and then there are functions most stress and zipped, and these implicit specifications are documented by QSharp's library designers in comments. So, so they do exist, they are just not in a form that can be utilized by a type checker. So most says that it requires an array of certain type and it returns another array. But what it says, what the specification says is it's the array which is from zero to the length of the array minus two. That is, it is skipping, that it's not including the last element. Similarly for rest, uh, it starts from the first index and goes up to the length minus one. That is, it excludes the first element only and gives you the rest. And zipped uh, takes left and right to input arrays. They can be of different types, T and U. And what it returns, it's a, it's an array of pairs where, uh, you know, left and right are drawn from left and right 
for each index. So this is what you expect, but uh, this is implicit, right? So to go from implicit specifications to explicit, I've been playing with this uh, language called Wiley for just prototyping code. And I'll, I'll show some code in the next slide. So what is Wiley, first of all? It's a hybrid imperative and functional programming language, which is what we are saying Q Sharp is as well, except Wiley does not know anything about quantum computing, right? So uh, this is a classical imperative and functional hybrid language, and it provides static checking of pre and post conditions. So type checking that we were talking about can also include pre and post conditions, and we will see. So these specifications can be uh, encoded as pre and post conditions, right? And then there is uh, another tool I, I use called Boogie, which is an intermediate verification language and a compiler. Uh, what the role of Boogie is that it's a high level interface to Z3. Because if you have ever played with Z3, it's like the assembly language of verification. And you do not want to work at that low level because it everything becomes much harder. So Boogie gives you a very nice high level interface. And uh, the relevance of Boogie is that uh, Wiley used to be a language which had its own constraint solver. It was not using Z3. And they recently switched from, went from using their native solver to Z3 by translating the code to Boogie. And they gained a lot, uh, which they documented in a recent journal paper, uh, Journal of Automated Reasoning. So they say that Wiley to Boogie translation, Boogie and Z3 stack offers them significant advantages over native Wiley verify in terms of percentage of programs that can be verified automatically. So they have a large benchmark and uh, you know they they were able to cover a lot more of it when they started using Z3 via Boogie. And that's the kind of direction I'm thinking we can go with our Lambda Q sharp, that is translate from Lambda Q sharp to Boogie and Boogie will call into Z3 and we can then solve uh, specifications. And I'll, I'll show a prototype which does not have Lambda Q sharp in it. So here's the prototype for the code that I showed you, the, the apply C not chain. Uh, I'm, I'll, I have broken it down so we can see how it's encoded in Wiley and how it corresponds to what we need to do. So the qubit type is basically just an integer. This is syntax for um, you know new type, but you can refine these types in Wiley. You can say that n has to be greater than or equal to zero. It cannot be negative, right? And this makes sense because qubits and Q-sharp are pointers or references and you can encode them as uh, positive integers, right? Natural numbers. So that's what I do here. Then there is a type for safe pair, which just, uh, it, it's a pair of qubits, P and Q, but we say that P and Q cannot be the same. And this lets us satisfy the condition needed by C0. C0 requires that it be given a distinct pair of qubits, right? So this is how we will encode um, distinct pair of qubits. And then we also define a distinct op, which which will act as the argument to apply to each, um, which takes a safe pair, because for the example that we saw, uh, we wanted to uh, encode C nodes. Uh, we wanted to encode C naught to give to apply to each. So we are directly using it here with safe pair as input. And notice that there's a distinction here between methods and functions. This is similar distinction as operations and uh, functions in Q-sharp. So we have encoded them the same way. And here null corresponds to unit type in Q-sharp, right? So we went to C0 already, apply to each takes this distinct top types op, and it returns, uh, or, or it takes another input, which is a register of safe pairs of um, qubits. And this is important because uh, C not requires safe pairs. And notice this in the prototype, I have specialized all the type parameters just to be able to focus on one task at a time. We are not dealing with polymorphism here at all. Everything is instantiated to the example we needed, right? And it returns a null or unit. So function most, now we see some specifications. So it takes a qubit array and returns a qubit array. And it's pre and post conditions are encoded here. So the precondition is very trivial, just says, give me at least one input 
in the qubit array right it should the length of qs should be at least one and then the post condition is that this output qubit array should be one less than the size of uh, input qubit array right and the other post condition which is more important is that for each index in zero to length of the array out uh, they should be equal, um, uh, they should be the same as in the input array, right? The indices at each index, the entry should be the same. So this encodes complete uh, specification of most, right? Similarly for rest, uh, first three lines are the same. For the last line, that's the only different one. Uh, for each entry in output array, uh, you ensure that output index i is the same as the i plus one index in the input array. This is what you expect from rest or tail, right? Uh, moving on to the other two examples, uh, we have the zipped function. This is one of the more complicated ones. It takes two inputs, axes and y's, and returns a safe pair. And this is again specialized for our need. That's why it's a safe pair output. First, it requires that the input arrays are the same sized, so the lengths are equal. And then we say that they should be distinct from each other. So for all entries, the um, QSI and YSI should be distinct. Otherwise, we will not be able to create a safe pair. And then the post conditions say that the output array should be of the same size as the input array, uh, one of them, because they are now all the same. And then the other post condition says that the left part P of the, you know, P and Q were the two parts of safe pair, if you remember from the type definition. So it's saying the left should be drawn from axes and the right should be drawn from Y's for each index in uh, X, Y's. And finally, we see the fairly trivial uh, preconditions on apply C not chain, which was our main function. It takes a qubit array and returns unit. It should re it requires you give us at least two qubits. Otherwise, we, we cannot really apply a C0. And it says that uh, input qubit should be unique. So here the post condition is not necessarily saying everything is unique. Uh, I mean, it is implying that, but it, it's a little more strict. It's just saying that, um, well, I just want to say that this post condition is specialized to our encoding in Wiley. We encode unique qubit arrays as indices from certain number uh, and increment them by one each time. So th this post con this precondition may change, but it it does the job. But the important point is with you know this specification that you saw in two pages and the fairly obvious implementations, this type, type checking goes through automatically, thanks to Boogie and Z3. That is, you do not have to write formal proofs, you do not have to manually you know, specify things, except places where loop invariants occur. So zipped does require a loop invariant, so that requires a little more work. But did, did, this takes us a lot of the way, right? So this is just a prototype. Um, we are trying to extend this work and generalize it and port it to Lambda Q Sharp. And this is on work with my collaborator, Jacob Swiffler, who is undergrad at U Chicago. And uh, yeah, I, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go fast and take questions. So other features, iterations and slices in Q Sharp are pretty similar to what I described. So they can be covered similarly. I didn't talk about mutable bindings, but they are very similar to how I model qubits uh, as quantum local stores. So we can do them as a classical local store and they should be uh, fairly straightforward after that. Parameter polymorphism is fairly limited in Q-sharp because they annotate all the you know types of operations and functions. That is a requirement in the language. So I think it's fairly easy as well. The other interesting and difficult things are how to deal with the within apply conjugation construct and a joint. Uh, so th those are hard things. I am you know, um, thinking about them on the side. I don't have clear solutions in my mind yet, but I'm working on them. Similarly, repeat until fix up. So these are very quantum specific abstractions that QSharp has, which are not fairly, not really common in other places, other languages. 
Um, and there are some other directions. We can mechanize the meta theory of the core language, which we haven't done. Uh, I mentioned briefly to Ming Shang earlier, uh, we can adopt ideas from my previous work on quantum hot type theory and propose a unified framework for you know, reasoning about quantum programs, which do not just talk about classical properties that we discussed today, but also quantum specific properties and verify them. And we can potentially also come up with a verified tool chain, which translates from, you know, um, Lambda Q sharp to languages like QIR or OpenCASM. And we can integrate with tools like verified LLVM for a verified tool chain. So that's the summary. Um, I just want to thank some of my collaborators uh, from Microsoft Quantum. There is Bettina and Alan Geller who have been very helpful in help with this work and Brad and Aarti made me introduced to the QSharp team when I was interning and other people in the PL community, Bob Harper, Ohad, um, Jen Pekin and Sam Satan. So yeah, that's all from me. Um, thanks for having me and I would love to take some questions. Uh, th <clears throat> thanks, uh, Kartik, for the beautiful talk. Uh, before we uh, take uh, the question, let me uh, uh, mention that uh, Kartik did uh, very significant contributions to our community of uh, corner programming. He uh, created and, uh, and maintained the web page of uh, uh, research on uh, quantum program language and the verification. So, so Kartik, can you, can you show the, the, the page? Oh yeah, sure. It's, um, it's, it's very useful, I guess, I guess uh, you know, the, the, uh, in particular for students. Yeah, uh, I think can, uh, they can find, uh, they can find the left that. from there. Yeah. Um, let me try going to my browser. Okay. So, well, uh, here is a shortcut way to go to it, kit.ios and qpl hyphen bib but i can share the link in the chat um right so it's it's basically a website which lists a lot of publications in the quantum community across different journals and um paper, conferences etc so you can navigate it just you know go to here you can search using uh, you can filter things, you can search them. So we were talking about QPCF, right? So let's see if PCF is here. So it's very easy to find things this way. Or you can use the search button here. So QPCF, right? Um, there are two papers on that basically. Actually a third one was a survey sort of summarizing that work. And you can other, other than that, you can also look at papers by each author. So for example, Ming Sheng has lots of papers because <laughs> you've been publishing for so long. So Thank you. you can Thank you. basically list everyone's papers. And if you want to look, look at the all of the papers, there is a retro. So I think now there are 164 papers already here. Um, I went there by using this retro link. And uh, yeah, so main advantage, main way I use it is by using this site button. So for each of these entries, there is a, you know, BibTeX entry created, which you can copy paste when you go through your, when you write your bibliographies in your papers. And I think that just makes it, uh, you know, a nice way to easily find correct bibliography entries. <laughs> Thanks, Kathik. Uh, now let's uh, take a question. Yeah. Question? Uh, are you able to see my screen or? I, yeah, I, I can see your question. I, I can see your uh, screen. Uh... Oh, do you see the slide still or do you see the other screen? The, the, the web page of your, uh, the literature. Oh, I see. Um, Maybe you can go back to the, to the, to the slides. The share. Okay. Hi, I have say uh, first. I have one general question for this web page. Do you update the I mean the entries manually, or have a do you have an automatic way of getting some resources from say DBLP or other uh, database? Um, so, uh, to be honest, there is honestly there is no automatic way to do it, even if you consult DBLP or other places, because nobody has correct data. You need a human person to make sure everything is correct. And that's why I do it manually. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, I there is if you find a paper and if you want to, you know, uh, suggest it, you can just use this Google form, and uh, that it has two options: you can suggest a new paper or you can correct an entry. So it's in a way it's crowdsourced, open source completely, and people yeah. can directly uh, contribute this way. Um, yeah, it, it's very hard to maintain correct metadata. So no online server actually does that apart from publishers, but even publishers mess up sometimes. But here I try to maintain everything correctly. Okay, okay. okay. So the next question is, so coming back to your to your talk, because you start yeah. from a very functional language and then, uh, and then you jump to arrays. So for me, it seems more natural if you add the least, uh, I would say that's Maybe that's easier to deal with than a race, right? Yeah, that is correct. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to share my screen again and it's kind of not showing me the <laughs> option to do that. Ah, I'm now I have it. With Q -sharp. So is, in Q -sharp, do you have list or not? So the way, uh, what, what's happening in QSharp is they provide a list-like interface through the libraries. So the ex functions you saw, Apply to each, map, zipped, not map. There was most, rest, zip. They are all list-like functions. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, lists uh, you know, are recursive data structures, which QSharp does not have. So they have arrays instead, which give you guarantees about uh, you know, uh, order one access to any entry, et cetera. But they are designed to be immutable. So they are, in a way, very functional but not fully because of the problems that I showed. Okay. But you're right that it's a list-like interface and we certainly can think about it that way. The problem is that uh, if you want to apply the technique that I did in the Lambda QSharp without arrays, that is index them with a separate symbolic qubit name, the array does not remain a uniform type anymore. It becomes a heterogeneous array, or you can think of it as a heterogeneous list which are not easy to deal with. There is no known way to extend the technique that I showed you without using solvers, the, uh, like Z3, which I'm doing. Okay, uh, the last question is, uh, so you have, if suppose you have a quantum array, and then how to ensure that, so each elements in this array are distinct from each other? Um, yeah, so, uh, in my example, I showed the way we have encoded arrays. Uh, well, I didn't show the array encoding, but it you have a hint here a little bit. Um, qubit arrays, first of all, a qubit is an integer, right? Yeah. So the way we are restricting in the prototype, uh, restricting the qubit array in a prototype is making sure that when you construct an array, it can only have a sequential list of integers in, in it. But since you have a general solver like Z3, uh, it can have more general precondition here. Instead of saying this, I can also say for each entry in QS, uh, that entry should not be equal to any other entry in, in uh, the same QS, right? So that, that's one way to ensure that qubits will be distinct. So for I simplicity, I showed this example. This condition. So the, I mean, the there's no say tab system to ensure that. Uh, that is correct. Uh, that's why we are using the solver. So the solver is giving you extra power that a type system, a simple type system, will not give us. We could use dependent types, for example, but you know they become undecidable, and we ah. do not want to have uh, very expressive type systems for a, a language aimed for you know, mass consumption by quantum programmers. It it becomes a different level of challenge. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? So Kavik, uh, I guess uh, your your ideas about this uh, layer can actually also use to uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, MPI. M maybe you know the paper uh, published the, the, at the end of the last year by uh, Matthias uh, and, and one of his uh, colleagues at the ETH about uh -huh. the quantum the MPI. There, uh, there's some. There are quite a lot of uh, nice, uh, you know, the uh, examples 
using uh, oh, the similar ideas of, uh, of the applying and C not chains. Oh, I see. Is I, with MPI? Do you mean the this parallelism interface? Yes, the exact okay. mess, message passing. Uh, message interface. passing interface. I see. Yeah, I actually have not seen the paper. I I should take a look. Thanks for yeah, that yeah, reference. I I can send to you if if you like. So. Sure. Yeah. Please send me that. Yeah. Okay, great. More questions. Oh, if not, then. Uh, Thanks, Kartik, again. So thanks. Thank you so much, Ming Shang, for having me and giving me this opportunity to speak with your group and other professors. I uh, I hope uh, we can uh, welcome you at, in, in, in Beijing uh, personally after the pandemic. <laughs> good, good. All right, and and ha I'm happy to you know answer questions over email if anybody else wants to reach out to me later. I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you.